What is up, Green Bay Packers fans? And welcome to another edition of the Daily Draft brought to you by the good folks at Badger State Brewing in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And it is our very first bonus episode. Hopefully many of you have either already listened to or watched Mock Draft Monday. But there's a little thing that went on in the draft world. Probably, I would argue, the second biggest deal that we have in draft season, only to the draft itself. That is the NFL Combine. So we are going to break down the winners and losers of that event. And joining me, very last minute, which we really, really appreciate because I was put in a little bit of a bind today. None other than the number one rival to the Pack a Day podcast, Mr. <laughs> Peter Bukowski. Peter, how are you, man? I'm good, Ross. I'm excited. There's so much to dig into with the numbers and guys who are still going to test. And so I am i can't wait. I've, I've already started the like, hey, this guy worked out better than I thought. Let me go back and watch him a little bit again. So yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm really uh, excited to dig in with it. Let me give you the floor for just one second because I've, you know, we do pro- a lot of prospect primers do Mock Draft Monday. I've chosen Mock Draft Monday as kind of uh the time that I have to get like a, a takeoff. So I'll take like the first, the first six, seven minutes of mock draft Monday and, and address something that I've been getting a lot on Twitter X or, or just kind of a philosophy of mine as it relates to the, the Packers and how they do things. And so my opinion on what people would, I think kind of, and I'm, I'm sort of rambling here, but I, I think the general idea from the fan base is the Packers are, are a stringent and b kind of too stringent on like their athletic requirements. I, I feel like there's a lot of negative, not a lot, but I, I would guess that most of what I get on what well, you talk about RAS, this, that, or the other is that green Bay is, is maybe too obsessed with what we just saw, which is the, the underwear Olympics of it all, the running, the jumping, the lifting, all of those things. What, what's your take on, on kind of the, the Ron Wolf thresholds that became the Ted Thompson thresholds that became the Brian Gutekunst thresholds. What, what's your sort of take on just kind of how they do business? Yeah, that were actually started as the Al Davis thresholds as well. I mean, he kind of got off the deep end with it. Like, Hey, just run the yes. 40 really fast, but <laughs> the Darius um, Hayward Bay of it all, <laughs> but <laughs> that's mean. I'm sorry, Darius. No, it's okay. We, <laughs> we respect Darius. Remember this is, this is the, the, I, I think this is a Mike McCarthy quote that in the NFL, there's, there's the, the categories of players. There's, there's good players, there's great players. No, there's there's I, it, whatever it is. It's like there's good players and great players, and that's it. Um, because everyone's in the NFL, everyone's really good. Yeah. And so let's just we can just take that. Okay. Um, if you look at the average NFL player anywhere, any position, pick a position, they are an above average athlete. And in fact, uh, our our pal, um, Ken Laplatt, who does the relative athletic score, he calls it RAS. We kind of have like a GIF GIF thing here with him. Um, 80% of NFL starters are above average athletes or better. And so athleticism matters. Like, yes, you can point to the outliers and you can say, oh, look at this guy and look at that guy and look at this guy. They are exceptions that prove the rule. And I I kind of am flabbergasted, especially when it comes to receiver. How could you look at the track record of Green Bay Packer receivers and go, yeah, they need to change this. Greg <laughs> Jennings and Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb and James Jones and Devontae Adams and on and on and on. And go, mm, they need to they need to pick smaller players. When when they've done that, they get Amari Rogers. Oh, they need to pick uh it's okay if they pick less athletic players. Okay, Josh Myers over Creed Humphrey, Jay Sternberger over Terry McLaurin. Like we can point to all of these examples and go, mm, actually, when Brian Gutekinds goes outside of his thresholds or we want to say preferences, I like to say athletic models, it, it it they they are less successful. And so I don't understand the like chase outliers mentality here. I, I don't believe in that. I think it reduces your, your probabilities of hitting. Um, but sometimes you're going to hit like if it were me, I never would have drafted Josh Sitton, but they did it and it worked out. So sometimes it works out and everyone wants to point to that one time it worked out and ignore the 300 times that it didn't. And so that's, you know, that's fine. I get it. It's usually to prop up a particular player. Like for example, I know that, that you're a big fan of, of, Sainer still from Michigan, who's tiny. He was five nine. So much. And yeah, and and I get it. Um, you watch the tape and you go, yeah, this guy can play. He can absolutely play. I wonder, Ross, if they will for a nickel when they said Amari Rogers, a different type of player for us. We we look at him differently. I wonder if they'd be willing to do that for nickel corner. They basically never spent real draft capital of any kind 
on a corner that they intended to play in the nickel. And yeah. I just wonder and, if that is a, a draft philosophy or if that's just how it's played out. Because if you look at it over time, they've had a lot of like young players come in. Okay, now you're the slot and you become. Casey Hayward's the great example. He comes in as yeah. a slot and then moves outside. Um, and that made sense. And then they drafted Demarius Randall. And they were able to move Casey Hayward back in the slot because they could put Demarius Randall outside. It's really nice to have guys that'll play all over, but you have to have guys who can play all over. The Packers might have might have one of those guys. So it'd be nice to get a couple more. Yeah, and even Demarius Randall should have been playing free safety, but uh, <laughs> it's beyond the point. Um, yeah. And, and really, that has been my biggest argument. I, I mean, I would say I'm very pro. I mean, I, I get plenty of crap for being as vocal as I am that it's not a huge problem. I'll miss um, on athletes all day. Like, yeah. give me the chance to hit a home run with someone, and I'm good. Like, that's fine. I'll miss. Um, and I, and I, I have and will continue to miss betting on athleticism. That's fine. I will live with that. I would hate to bet all my chips on a guy who's not athletic, an outlier, a Bryce Young, who could still have a fine NFL career. Like, you watch him week one, and you go, this guy's just not big enough. Like, I'm <laughs> those outliers, to me are that you have to understand you're elevating your risk when you try and bet on it. You better have a really, really, really freaking good reason of doing that. I didn't think the Panthers did. I didn't like the Bryce Young pick. There were two quarterbacks I would have taken over Bryce Young. They took neither of them. And it looks like right now that those other two guys are just flat better. And because they have better traits, they have better physical tools. I think that, I think that matters in a lot, a lot of cases. And the, the two spaces, I guess that I have, kind of championed uh, a change or, or just an adjustment as how, how p things are looked at. And, and really it's the, the slot both on both sides of the ball. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted them to sort of treat that as its own position and, and start to, Oh, we'll just put our third best corner there, or we'll put our kick return there, or we'll grab Chandon Sullivan from the Eagles practice squad and throw him there. It's like, man, you want a super bowl playing one of the best three defensive backs of all time at nickel. And he wrecked the game. Yeah. And you saw that blueprint and went, you know who'd be good at nickel? Keyshawn Nixon. And I, I get that there are, you know, Charles Woodson doesn't grow on trees, of course. Yeah, right, right, right. I get all that. But I, I just have wanted them to sort of treat it at its as its own thing with the Saner still stuff. I mean, we're still talking about an 85th percentile athlete. And he on on the, the Raz side for being five nine and three eighths, which is taller than I thought, not not much, but taller than I thought it might be. Being five nine three eight, there, was some, there and, was some talk that he might be like five seven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and so you know one eighty two is not that big of a deal when you are five five nine and three eight. He's you know he's got a basically a nineteenth percentile height and a twenty fifth percentile weight. So for the that drags down your relative yeah. athletic score. So for the relative athletic score to still be eight point five one is is actually really impressive. To it me. means athletically he's really really gifted uh, and a hundred percent. And and especially what do you want from a guy that's small? Well, he needs to be able to jump. And my God in heaven, can he jump? His yeah. explosives were crazy. Almost an eleven foot broad and a forty inch vert. But it's not it's not the Mikey Sainer still uh, episode. We've actually already done that. So the the slot go right? back and watch slot, it. Slot receiver and. Uh, slot corner and and they did they they said hey amari rogers is a different thing for us that's why the our whatever doesn't apply and it went terribly <laughs> but, but, but by, right. by the way the whatever didn't necessarily apply perfectly to Jaden reed Jaden reed is not and was not a tier one fit jacob stack our or, well, I, I outed his real name jake's a teacher now i really outed him <laughs> jacob morley whose real name is jake stack i think enough people know that he he developed kind of these tiers for uh that, that we use on the packer report draft guide yeah. where it's like okay if he hits all five of these things he's tier one if he goes four for five he's tier two and on down the line Jaden reed was not a tier one packers receiver and it appears to have worked out tremendously and maybe that's they also told him they, to add weight. They said, can you get to 195 and be okay? And he said, yeah. And so he said, okay, I'll, I'll bet I'll put on the weight. And he did. Right. But, but not necessarily even as tall as they would normally right. like. And um, I can't remember if there was maybe an agility that he either didn't run or, or didn't necessarily jive because he's 40 jived fine. He was playing Jane Reed's plenty fast, fast, but anyway, not a tier one. He just was not a, a, a tier one. Um, and in fact, they really like you if you're like six, one, two Oh five or, or better. I mean, that's, you, you think about James Jones and his thick build and, and, and then of course, Jordy Nelson. And I mean, Greg Jennings and Donald driver were certainly on the smaller side of even what they actually like. And they took drive in the seventh. Uh, the other thing is 
the adjustment for me at wide receiver, I, I would have been more okay with because of the change of the rules. I, I think guys like Tank Dell can survive as he ends the season on injured reserve with a broken leg <laughs> that happened on a goal line. But, but your Tank Dells and your 2-2 Atwells, you know, they, they've been put into uh, Mc, McVay's Shanahan systems. Obviously, literally 2-2 Atwell plays for McVay. Yeah. So it can be done. And I, I know that that Matt wants guys to go out there and run block. Like I, I get all that for sure. But um, I loved Tank Dell. And that's not like, hey, look at me. I was right. that Because I've screwed up on smaller receivers too. But a guy like even Xavier Worthy, I don't think Brian Gutekunst is even acknowledging Xavier Worthy exists. Not a I don't think he's to bounce. No. I, I would. I, I and but that's me and I, and so there that's part of the tough part of um Packers projection too. I love Tavondre Sweat. I have been talking a ton about Tavondre Sweat. You think the, the you, you he's not going to be a Packer? No. So there there are guys that I like, and then I have to separate that from projection to the Green Bay Packers. Um, anyway, we've gone on long enough with with this. Uh, we, we st- we're going to try and keep this to roughly 20 minutes, and we haven't even gotten into what the heck we're talking about today, which is big winners and big losers from the NFL draft. I'm going to go ahead and get started on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, Kent does such a great job by kind of uh, – not, not kind of. I mean, he literally will take the elite ones and put them in green and the bad ones and put them in red. So yeah. <laughs> the work is almost done for us. Um, on the offensive side of the ball – my my heart, my soul, my love, Johnny Wilson. How about my guy? My comp for Johnny Wilson was uh, the long-armed creatures from Stranger Things. That's my comp for Johnny Wilson. And, and I look, I understand fully, not a tremendously productive athlete uh, or wide receiver. Um, absolutely gets after dudes in the run game. But Florida State could do a lot of winning throwing the ball to, to uh, Keon Coleman and handing it off to Trey Benson. And I'm not saying that that necessarily excuses the lack of production from uh, Johnny Wilson, but there were other ways for them to win. It, it's the Christian Watson argument. Uh, Green Bay has loved, loved productive wide receivers. I, I went down the list. Jordy Nelson had a 1600 yard year at Kansas state before Green Bay drafted him. Greg Jennings had 3000 yard seasons at Western Michigan. Uh, Randall Cobbs last year at K- Kentucky, he had 1400 scrimmage yards. Yeah. I, I can go on, but the point is the point. Christian didn't. Why? Because NDSU handed the ball off for six and a half a carry and won four national championships while I was there. It just didn't matter. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't matter at Florida State, but he was not the only option. And so for him to have some of the agility stuff that he did and and just in general, and and the exact opposite of what we just said with Mikey Sandra still applies to Johnny Wilson. His enormousness, which is, I think, 6'6", 3'8", and pert near 240, Big dude. That that drags up. So it, it, had he run the 40 at 4.50, which I think was a little slower than that, but his 4.50 would be different than a 160 pound receiver who's five at nine. Right. It's as more value. Right, we have to speed adjust these things. It's why it's why relative athletic score is not enough. We need to be able to adjust these. This is a huge thing in running backs. The like one of the biggest signifiers for running backs is Spark, or now it's Spork. I think they've changed the acronym for whatever reason. They've tweaked the formula. But you have to be able to speed adjust these things. Keon Coleman, who I don't know if we're going to talk about or not, but he runs 462. You and I talked about him on the X machine. And but then goes out and runs the gauntlet at 20 plus miles per hour, was the <laughs> fastest receiver in the gauntlet, and yeah. just looked like butter going through. I mean, just yeah. as smooth as absolute silk. And so I'm kind of just like, I don't care. I just, I mean, yeah. I just don't like run a good three cone, spend the next month figuring out how to run the L. And and run a six nine eight L and be fine. That would be my just, advice to Keon Coleman. He's probably not going to do that. But yeah. uh, find a way to run the forty Mike, in like four five seven too. Like just find a way to shave. I mean, yeah, it'd be, if you could shave a couple you, at a pro day, you gotta you gotta believe that like they're gonna shave a couple right. off anyway. Um, that that downhill track that they have at Penn State. Um, they literally have a downhill. It's like three or four inches of downhill on the on the Penn State track. Uh, but the, the Johnny, the, the, like the, that comp, I heard Mike Renner on Mina Kimes show comparing him to Darren Waller. And I think that that, that sure. is a potential, a, a potential comp there. The question I think for the Packers is like, okay, what is the value then? If he's going to do a lot of the same stuff that like Luke Musgrave is going to do, where, where does the value meet the upside there? I would, I would kind of go the other way. Like I felt like Keon Coleman 
get a get a ball winner in this offense, and that's the only thing that they don't really have. Yeah. And, and I think Christian Watson can do some of that. I think Romeo Dobbs can do some of that. Hell, I think Dontavian Wicks and Jaden Reed for their size can do some of that. But to get a guy 6'6 six, six plus in the red zone, like they had some issues in the red zone last year, that just that's, cleans and, and it right that's up. What, yeah, that's what Johnny Wilson is to me as a red zone monster and also um, a perimeter. Mo I mean, I, I put together a cut up of him just killing dudes in the run game i mean he's if lazard was a better athlete yeah and and, and it was bigger and I, again you know are you gonna move him to tight i don't care i just on the roster like musgrave splits out watson plays slot they have all sorts of like different things that they can move around i don't need him to block in line ever but you even saw him as a wing and literally yeah. moving guys out and and so that was kind of my thing you know whether you call him wide receiver five or tight end three i truly do not care um but whether it's a green bay packer thing or not I, people thought he was kind of just a big dude and not much of an athlete and for his ras to end up at 9.88 is a rocket ship situation pretty good yeah and, it's and pretty good so that's uh that's a big deal for him i think the other obvious thing would be xavier worthy we won't go there i do want to talk about um, one other prospect at a different position that I think really did did some work and will move up my board and 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 not necessarily even a hundred percent because of the work that he did because he didn't work his arms to be long. but a Washington offensive lineman Troy Fatanu, I really thought was a guard all day long, still end up might being a guard all day long. I believe he was six, three and three quarters. Bakhtiari, I would guess would be sort of uh, Brian's Mendoza line once talked about Jair Alexander as being on the Mendoza line for corner. I don't know that Brian Gutekunst is going to allow anyone to trot out a six, three and three quarters tackle, but Fatanu has uh elite arms arm length for a guy, his size. He has long, he has length. And uh, I thought that he wore 317 pounds really well. You can see the guys who are sloppy and I'm not trying to be mean, but like when they oh, do the on field dr drills at the combine, you can see the guys who are sloppy and you can see the guys who are 317 and aren't sloppy. And Fatano was that he moved really well, um, tested extremely well, ended up with uh, uh, just had it here. a 9.45 RAS at tackle, meaning he's probably in the nine sevens at guard, yeah. which means he's just an elite, elite athlete. And I don't know that the Packers would take him necessarily to play tackle, but I think he'd be a great emergency tackle that you're starting at guard. And whether you're talking about a Green Bay Packers aspect or not, I think Fatano was just a big winner of, of everything that went on because he did what you needed to do, which is look good in, in a compression shirt and shorts and, and run well, which is what, which is what he did and work out well. And I just think it was a good weekend for I Fatano. I think all these offensive linemen at the top, that, that like top tier of like 10 or 12, they all and and I don't know I don't know if there's really a cutoff. Brian Bulaga had 33 inch arms, right? Anyone that's had below 33 inch arms for the Packers has been a guard. Sean Ryan, Josh Sitton, TJ Lang, all those guys were 32, 31, whatever it is. It becomes interesting then when you've got someone like Graham Barton who's six five, but it's 32 and seven eighths arms. It was the same. Um, <laughs> like that's I mean, yeah. I'll talk yep. about the, if if 33 yeah. is the Mendoza line. Are we going to, are we going to quibble over an eighth of an inch when you're six, five and move like he does, you can play all five. I don't know, man. Like that seems like a foolish thing to do. And there are a couple guys at the top here who are in similar positions where it's like Jordan Morgan, same thing. He's six, five, six, six, three thirty, So he'd be the biggest offensive lineman they've drafted since Marshall Newhouse and 32 and seven eighths arms. Is he a tackle? Is he a guard? I kind of don't care because I feel like at 25, you could get a really good player who plays guard for you or competes to play guard for you. And worst case, he becomes your swing tackle and has a chance to compete for let him, let him push Rashid Walker. If you want to um, see what you can do, see if you have someone who can play right tackle and then Zach Tom can be your center. If you want to do it that way, it just gives you a lot of flexibility. I'm, I'm never going to say no to a guy that I think could play tackle, but I'm going to try him at guard. And the Packers have a history of kind of doing it the other way. Like Derek Sherrod, was a tackle that they wanted to play tackle, but they needed him at guard. And so they said, hey, why don't you give this a shot? It didn't go great. And then he broke his leg in 16 yeah. places. And so that becomes problematic. Um, you need two legs to play offensive tackle. I don't know if you know that, but uh, they, like, they are, they're not afraid to cross-train people. Like they were going to let Elton Jenkins play tackle. Like if, if last year Elton Jenkins had been healthier, he probably could be 
their starting right tackle right now. Maybe Zach Tom is a guard. I don't know. Um, but I, I think all of those guys, and I said this on Locked on Packers, if you, if you believe in their ability to play both guard and tackle, then you give yourself a chance to hit on a guy who could obviously potentially start at either one of those places. But if you have a, a guy that you think can play tackle, then that gives you more options at 25. If you go, well, I think Fatanu can play tackle or I think Graham Barton can play tackle in a pinch. And if he can't, then we'll put him at guard, put him at center, see what you can do. It just makes it more appealing to take one of those guys at 25 just on the chance that they can play tackle because that's, we're talking about first round draft pedigree. Like I liked Rashid Walker. He was a nice player in year two, but that doesn't mean you can't upgrade from a player like that. That doesn't mean if you've got someone who's got, you think first round ability that they shouldn't get a chance to go do that. And so that just, it gives Green Bay a lot more options. And I love that for them at 25. In fact, my mock draft Monday, you haven't seen it yet. It hasn't gone on the X machine as we record this, but I, I picked, uh, Graham Barton at 25 and Tyler Guyton fell to me at 41. And I was just like, let's go. You've got a guy that could play guard, could play center, could play tackle. And Tyler Guyton, who could be a, a, a Pro Bowl caliber left tackle, has that kind of freaky movement skills. They've never drafted someone that big. I think they're going to have to start thinking about it when these guys come in like transformers, because that's what this class is right now. Any big winners for you? A couple winners on the offensive side of the ball? Well, so I mentioned those offensive linemen. Um, I think I think this running back class, for as much as we had issues with some of the, the top guys not being top guys, like there, there is not even really a consensus top 50 kind of pick. Braylon and Allen didn't jump the way that we thought he could. But to see Jalen Wright blaze a 40, talk about weight adjusted 40 time. Isaac Guarendo, former Wisconsin Badger at Louisville, home run hitter, run 4-3-3 at 225, dear God. Um, Marshawn Lloyd from, from USC, who I was like, no, he's too small. He's 209 shows up at 220 and runs four, four, one. Like it is your weight adjusted speed is such an essential thing for these running backs. Um, and I'm missing someone who, I, oh, Trey Benson. I think he ran four, three, seven, four, three, nine at, at two fifteen. So they're they're They need some, some pop in this running game. I love Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones can be a Packer for life as far as I'm concerned. But this running back group on day two, you know, Audric Estime did not test great for seven. Like if he falls to the fourth or fifth round, like I still probably would consider him. But I really, really like this middle tier, this day two group of guys between like picks 50 and 120. There might yeah, be eight running about, backs where I'm just like, sign me up. I've been talking about that group all all, all season. Uh, Ray Davis, things went kind of yep. okay for him. But I mean, he's in that. Group for me with Jalen Wright and and Audric Estime and um, with a guy I'm going to talk about now, which is maybe some things didn't go so well this weekend, and I, I feel bad for Bucky Irving and and the way oh, you know just too small, yeah, and and not like there are small backs that work out fine, but you have to have some pretty elite stuff going on from a testing standpoint if you're going to be small. You can't be small and not athletic. That that becomes, you know, borderline disqualifying. You talk about uh, RAS well, score. Especially under at 192. Like 192 yeah. and to not run fast or test explosively. Like that's just, like what we're talking about borderline NFL player then at that point. And that becomes yeah. problematic if you're taking him on day two. Right. And and I, I had Bucky at 119 overall and running back eight going. I mean, he was very much in the – and I'm, I like Dylan Lobb who tested really – well, except for speed, um, I think he's going to make it as a third down back in this league uh, right next to the guy that I have him right next to, which is Will Shipley. I don't know that Shipley actually tested. He might have been hurt kind of late in the season. Anyway, but that that group that, that we've been talking about, which to me, um, I, I kind of now, especially after the combine, have, have a tier with uh, Brooks, who won't do any testing because he got hurt super late in the in the season. Yeah. Um might have to bump my my guy Blake Corum down a little. Uh, you need you need to be a little. Uh, he's five, not disqualifying. Yeah, he's not disqualifyingly bad from a testing standpoint. But I, when you're that small, you should be kind of not. We shouldn't be having the are you disqualified conversation. We should be having holy cow, he can jump or broad jump or run conversation. Um, so Corum was in that group, and I'm not saying he's going to like fall off a cliff, but. Uh, that that tier had Corum Brooks, then Trey Benson, who everybody's talking about, 
And, and it kind of wrapped up at RB4 and RB5 for me with Braylon Allen and Marshawn Lloyd. And, and they did fine. And, and all that is, is good. But Bucky Irving was sort of part of that next group, which I think has some specialty backs in it. Like I said, Shipley, Laub, um, and, and I, you know, Estime being kind of the, the bigger specialty back, if you will. Irving being a smaller specialty back, then you get into Jalen Wright, which is just sort of like, ah, my college career maybe didn't go the way that I wanted, but I'm a space alien. That that group, well, now Bucky Irving, I don't know if he can even be a part of that group, and that's that's too bad. Anybody else that on the offensive side of the ball that had a, a weekend where you were just like, oh boy, you know, I I, I mentioned I mentioned Braylon Allen, I just I, he didn't do a lot. But I expected him to be much more explosive with the jumps than he was for someone that can deadlift a million. Yes. Like I just I kind of thought that like, okay, when you have that kind of power in your legs, that you'd see more out of the broad jump. You'd see more out of the vertical jump. And and, and it doesn't take away from what, what he puts out on tape. I'd I'd still like to see him run a good time. I think that kind of can can paper over a lot of things. Uh, I still think he fits really well with what the Packers are looking for from a big back. Brian Gudikins talked about wanting a big back. And so that's, that's a really nice thing um, to be able to have in your arsenal, that power. I, they, they need more though. I think from that running back position, they need a home run hitter. And so I feel like if he's, if he's not going to be testing as that sort of explosive athlete, like AJ Dillon, not a home run hitter and texted tested way more explosively than Braylon Allen. That makes me a little nervous. Um, and so, you know, that, that's not great. Let me just add this name in here just to flag it. It has nothing to do with the Packers, but it's, it's something I wanted to bring up. Why didn't Jaden Daniels weigh in? I, I I don't understand. I understand not throwing. I understand not being a part of it, but like to not even measure when people are worried about your frame and then you're, I guess you're not going to run your 40 at your pro day, but you're still worried. Like JJ McCarthy put on what? 15 at least pounds of whatever for, for the combine. I wanted to see Jaden Daniels show up the quarterback from LSU who might be a Minnesota Viking. And that would hurt me a lot because I think he's a really good player. Uh, I, I I wanted him to show up, not to show up and compete like that, like the guy at you know harassing Caleb Williams, but I just found it surprising that he didn't show up with you know like hey I'm two fifteen like JJ McCarthy did or hey I'm two twenty. Um, I, I wanted to see him do that because it would tell me that like okay I understand this is a problem for me at the NFL level and I'm working to fix it. Now if he shows up at his pro day and he's two twenty five and he like does the drills. And looks great, cool, but I wanted I wanted to see it in Indy. Sure, no, I, I get that. Um, on the and and I, I I miss too when everybody would work out. And this this is just like get off my lawn stuff. Too, yeah, this but is like, old guy stuff. I you know Mar Calvin Johnson worked out. Everybody know he was going first. He uh, wasn't I, I, going to work out though. He and he grabbed. He used someone else's cleats. That's the famous story. Is he, he said, sure. "Hey, I need a pair of cleats." But what I'm saying is, like, we have a lot of these testing benchmarks from the top guys and the guys that knew yeah. they were going to be the top guys. And to me, it just kind of stinks that we didn't get to see, like, Marvin Harrison Jr. work out. It, it, it stinks that nobody does the agilities anymore. <laughs> and, and that really is well, the schedule. I, the Packers are yeah. part of the problem with that, Ross, because everyone knows now that if you're there, are, there are teams, the Patriots are another one, where these agilities matter a lot yeah, to them. And so you only have you know, something to lose in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases. And, and they so, do them at the end of the day and it's, you've already well, been working out. Yeah. I thought yeah, Brett Coleman made a really good point on that. Like do them yeah. first. Um, but then you, I hear you, but then you, you hear the story of Roma Dunze, who, by the way, people are going to like be cynical about it. Not performative at all. Uh, he was there trying, he ran a six, eight something three cone. And he had been in testing, felt like he could get down to 6'6", six, six, which be, would be a crazy number for someone 6'1", 215. Yeah, for someone as big as he is. And yep. he ran it, apparently ran it for like an hour, trying to beat <laughs> the number. Kept After everyone's down gone, the he's yeah. just still there trying to beat this. And it's like, that is what I want. And I know that that's an old guy thing, but I'm telling you, it's not performative. I got a chance to talk to Rome at, at Super Bowl if he goes to Chicago, I'm going to be so mad, Ross, because that guy is going to be an absolute freaking superstar. I, I He's charismatic. He just is a special, special kid. And I, I can't say enough good things about him. Yeah, I've got some I've got some Chargers buddies and I'm just like, can you deal with that, please? To pick five. I know you probably should take Fashanu or Alt, but can you just deal with that? Please. Or take neighbors at five and let the Giants take him at six. And then, and yeah. then we're just it's over. Yeah. 
Either way, either way. Okay, a uh, couple guys that on the uh, defensive side of the ball mm-hmm. that I think did did themselves some favors for me. Uh, number one is, and this was honestly kind of like a, a roller coaster, is Chop Robinson from Penn State because Chop comes in and he's got these T-Rex arms, and that's super scary because length is an issue. And, and in general, um, you know, teams value length at the edge position because you don't want to get swallowed up by these big tackles like that. That's a very real concern when you are not one of these built in a lab uh you know, long, I use the stranger things joke, but like when you don't look like Rashawn Gary looks teams get a little, little scared. So at that point it's okay. I'm a speed rusher. Okay. Well, you better be a freak. And he is. <laughs> and so, and, and, and look, I, I think chop, you know, does some stuff well with, with counter moves and stuff, but um, you're going to run a four, two, five short shuttle at two fifty four, and run a four, four, eight 40 with, elite explosives and i i'd be interested to see the the three cone as well but the 10 yard split of 1.54 uh yes he is just a speed rusher but cool (laughs) you know and 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 if you're just gonna win one way i I get it that that does lessen your value a little bit and he's more of a top like 15 to 20 guy than a top 10 guy for me but when he came in with the short arms that i think was worrisome and then it's how are you going to win at the nfl level well, I'm just shot out of a cannon. That's how I'm going to win at the NFL level. I am going to be faster than your tackle. I am going to turn the corner. And if I'm able to do that 10 times a season, I'm going to the Pro Bowl. And that's, that, you know, that's kind of, the again, up and down. One guy for me, and, and this has Packers kind of written all over it, Pac-12, yada, 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 is I, I mentioned the honorary uh, Jordan Love, Dontavion Wicks, Jaden Reed All Stars of last year's tape is better than this year's, and unfortunately, one, the the next guy that I'm going to talk about was uh, two guys on this list. One things went really bad, and one things went well. And the one guy where things went really well, and he's going to take a, a northward journey on on my my list here is uh, Utah safety Cole Bishop. Mm. Fall reek, <laughs> and and has some cool. And tape we thought it was going to be the other Utah safety who was going to test like a freak, and he didn't. No, the, he's box safety all day. He's uh Hufanga from the from the 49ers. Seriously, like that's his that, that and and that's a, a super high level of what that guy is. But people talk about I, I call it center field. Halfley apparently calls it post safety, which I don't whatever you want to say. That ain't Vaki. And I didn't think it was ever gonna be. And that other safety in this system doesn't have to be like Charlie Pepper, and no disrespect to Charlie Pepper, but it it, it doesn't have to be just a guy, right? The, the right. Nick Collins was the post safety and Charlie Pepper was the not. And you can have a really fun <laughs> player. Well, I mean, you know, and, and, and you no, can you're right. Really, you're right. They you, won a Super Bowl with Charlie Pepper playing the not. And Hufanga is the really super exciting version of that player, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I wonder which version of that player Cole Bishop can be because he is a 98th percent a- a- athlete and going back and watching the film, it's interesting how much he played like slot corner, which, and, and so does that, you know, project to free safety? I don't know, but um, in general, just sign it, kind of some of the range questions with him, I think from a, purely athletic standpoint, it would be hard to answer them more firmly than Cole Bishop answered them. And I think, um, you know, he was player 106 for me. He had a low third round grade as, as far as after I got kind of into everything. A, I have to watch more games, but B, just based on testing, I mean, he's going to move up into the middle of the third round for me just based on being a 98th percentile athlete. Because as you said earlier in the show, like I'll guess wrong on athletes all day. Um, speaking of the uh, Jordan Love honorary my second to last year was better than my last year group. My, my guy, Cam Kinchins, Jesus. Uh, Rest in peace. Yeah. We're going to need the agent to leak something about something. Um, 2.11 RAS. Mm-hmm. Uh, Miami's pro day needs to go well. And, and that is like, not going to be a green Bay Packers stuff. That is box safety stuff. You are now Charlie Pepper. And I, I, I don't mean that, other than anything that he's just not, you're not going to play. He's either going to be in a quarter system or a too high system, or he's going to be a strong safety and that's fine. And he can be, he can make plays as a very extinctive player made a ton of plays, especially his, his second to last year at Miami. 
I can't, I don't ever say junior or senior because COVID has just destroyed designations, but 2022 Cam Kitchens was, was an absolute playmaker. You talk about disqualifying and I, the guy who I always use is the Holyfield kid, Evander's son, the Holyfield kid from oh Georgia. God. People loved him. Top 60 type love, like mocked often, even sometimes to green Bay in the top 64. And he went to the combine and things didn't get, get any better for him at Georgia's pro day. And I moved him to like 200th. And I, I said, this is disqualifying. What happened to Cam Kitchens in Indianapolis, if he can't make it any better at Miami's pro day, is is basically disqualifying. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you're right. And and let me let me flip it because th- there was a name that I put in a, in a mock draft, I think two weeks ago. People were like, what are you talking about? You can get him on day three. And I think that is just out the window now. Daydream Taylor Demerson, the safety from Texas Tech. He went out and played really well at the Shrine Bowl. And he showed up and he's a little short. He's 5'10 and change, but he's 197. So he's got the density that you like. He's in fact, almost exactly the same size as Darnell Savage was coming into the NFL. Ran 4'4'1 at 197, jumped 38. Um, that's in the 87th percentile, high 87th percentile, had a, a 10'3 broad jump. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Upper quartile in terms of percentiles. And he can play the post. He can play top down and he is a playmaker. He makes plays on the ball. And that is something that the Packers from a safety perspective have just not had really since Nick Collins, frankly, someone who can consistently maybe like one or two seasons games here or there of haha Clinton Dix was that, but he is someone who I think has, has that middle field safety written all over him can come up and make plays from, from depth as a tackler, even at that size, plays bigger than he is. If you want the plays bigger than he is, all-stars, Daydream Taylor Demerson is on it. And this is someone that our pal, our mutual friend, Jake Morley, turned me on to early in the process. He's like, yeah, go I was watch this say, kid. That's a Jake Morley guy. And, and I was like, I watched him and I was like, dude, you are so right. I hope, and he's like, I think he's going to run fast. I was like, he looks fast, but you never know because Kinchins looks certainly faster than 465 on tape. And so you're like, okay. And no, he's fast. 441 is fast, fast. And yeah. like, I think if there's a surprise, like the Packers take him a round and a half sooner than everyone thinks he's going to go, don't be surprised because I like there aren't, there just aren't that many guys that can play the post from college, especially because most teams don't ask him to do it. Yeah. Um, I, he can do it. And, and I think, with Taylor Demerson, he's going to move up kind of consensus. And a lot of these guys that hit, you, you, you're just going to see it. I mean, these guys that are hitting 95th percentile and up RAS are just going to move up. And it's not because everybody's following RAS. It's just because the guys that blow up the combine are going to move up. I mean, AD Mitchell is going to move up. You can't yeah. test like Christian Watson and not move up, yeah. which is, is basically what he did. Um, and and the other guy that's kind of in that boat who's even a little lighter that I really like and, and think maybe he could even play some slot corner is Jalen Simpson from Auburn. He 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 was the other guy with uh with Taylor Demerson that I I was thinking, you know, is he is he a little small from what the you know, is he is he not quite and he's even lighter than Daydream, but another guy where I thought, well, if Halfley doesn't care as much, you know, you start talking about what what will you really if if the if the free safety is that good at, at, at coverage, and if you're really going to count on your nickel and your strong safety to be the force players in the run game, how light are you going to, are you going to let, you're going to let 185 slide? Are you going to let 190 slide? Like what are, what are you going to let slide at free safety? That's, that's a question that we don't yet have answered. Anybody besides Cam Kinchins on the defensive side of the ball that really did not do it for you, or, or you think kind of probably, because there's one more guy I feel like I have to mention, but go ahead. Well, I, look, I, I wanted Nate Wiggins to not be 173. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I, 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 that was befuddling to me. It's like, if you're going to run 429, can you be 180 and run 432? Yeah. Like, I think that would be a lot better for you personally. Um, I think Ennis Rakestraw Jr. has to be yep, the name the for me. <laughs> um, and now he did, his agent did the thing. He's hurt. He had a hamstring injury. Like before the testing was even done, this was out there. It was a good agent. He had a hamstring injury. Um, and and that happened during the testing. And so he said, like, I'm gonna be back. And I believe him, by the way. I, I believe he is a tough MFer that, that he played through it. 
He looked a little stiff running the 40. And so that makes a, more sense given how loose I think he looks on tape that I was like, okay, well, maybe there was something wrong here. Like, I think he could very easily go out and run 442 at Missouri. And I'm not going to be that surprised. But he also like didn't jump great. And theoretically, that was when he would have been hurt. So it's like, okay, was it the first jump? Is that what happened? And you heard something like that, that's that's weird to me. It's just something I have my eye on there. Um, I, I just want let me just shout out one more winner though. And it's really two more. The slot corners, Jerry and Jones from from Florida State, um, ran four three eight uh at at six foot one ninety, and then um Max Melton is going to be a name that you're going to see related to the Packers a ton. It sounds like you're going to do a whole episode uh, on yep. him. The Melton brothers in Green Bay at 5'11 plus, 190 plus, um, you know, mid four threes and can cover, can play outside, can play inside. I think he could be the Packers Casey Hayward of this draft, someone who starts in the yep. slot and eventually you move to the outside because he can do it. Uh, Max Melton is is like a tailor-made Packer, but so is so is Jerry and Jones. Jerry and Jones so, in the Florida State. Like they play a ton of man coverage. And he can he can play inside or outside, I think. And you're you're getting so this this will come out after mock draft Monday. And I took Fatano in round one and 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 then I think um Brooks with the second. Oh, Chris Jenkins. So so Fatano and then Chris Jenkins from Michigan, and then um Jonathan Brooks from Texas at 58. So I was all the way through round two with no secondary additions. And then I used both third round picks on Jerry and Jones and Max Melton. And the reason that I took them both is because I actually believe Max Melton can hold up outside. Right. And, and, but you're right. I mean, the slot corners, good and bad. So Rakestraw, I always viewed as a nickel, wanted him to play nickel in Green Bay. Tackles be the perfect well. Perfect nickel strong. in Green Bay. Right. But he's got to test a little better. I mean, well, sorry, he would have been the perfect right, nickel in Green Bay. Right. And so that that was tough to see because it's like man, they're not gonna they're not gonna pick before someone else will pick him. If if that if this right. is his composite athletic profile, they're they're not gonna pick him before someone else will. Yeah. Um, but you like I mentioned I was super impressed with and we'll wrap up here, but um I was super impressed with Mikey Sainra still considering how much his height and weight were gonna pull him down and then you mentioned uh Jerry and Jones had a good combine and and people view him as a slot corner and then uh my guy from Kentucky Andrew Phillips yeah uh, had a really really smooth and twitched up in the uh, that seems yeah. like a, a, a like a an oxymoron but it's not like his ability to change direction the the athletic profile that he put together is really really nice i know that drills are like not everything but he looks really good in drills Absolutely. So, yeah, if you're a team like Green Bay is that probably needs a refresh at the slot corner position, uh, I think things went really well. The the, the one, the two other the third round is the spot. That's where yes. you're not, it's not a premium position, but it's still important. And so use they've got two third round picks like that's that's where I think. And that's where I like this corner class at the top. And at the end of day one, like those the guys between like 40 and 55, I just like there's like one guy that I like in that range. So. Yep. Yep. And we didn't, and he didn't test. Cause I think I know his name is TJ Tampa. <laughs> I think TJ Tampa can go earlier than that. I think I, I'm not going to be surprised if he runs four, four, five at, and Iowa state. And I think he's going to run fast. I think he could, I think he could sneak into the first round. My, my biggest thing with TJ Tampa is in my comp for him is Rasul Douglas. And, and that's great. And that you would burn a first round pick. If you knew you were getting third year Rasul, not what he was in his first two years, but he has the same type of thing where I got, frustrated with green Bay trying to play him as Nico is I Rasul does not turn particularly well. And I would like to see how TJ Tampa turns. I would like to see a Jill. I, I want to see the short shuttle and the three cone more than I want to see TJ Tampa's 40, but this is not the TJ Tampa episode. The two other guys that I wanted to mention on the defensive side of the ball before we thank Peter for his time, because this 20 minute episode is going on 44 right now is, uh, the two guys that I kind of like at the nose tackle position, I have gone on and on this off season about, um, Byron Murphy basically ends up being the player, uh, from, from Texas and he's great. I'm, I'm and, and honestly, Braden Fisk who blew up the combine is great too. I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm not the, the, the only guy that, that I think is, is sort of the exception for me is Chris Jenkins because he is maybe the pound for pound best run defender in this. So I don't care if he's 297. Other than that, I'm not adding a sub rusher. Devontae Wyatt right now is not defending the run, not defending it well. He's just not defending it. And and you add him to a room that already has three techs in Carl Brooks 
And Colby Wooden, who good three taxes. Right. I mean, you're going to keep Colby Wooden, I think. Why am I adding to the three tech room? You know, if if TJ Slayton or Kenny Clark gets hurt, I've got a really thin nose guard situation. So when I'm looking at nose guards and the two guys that I kind of like that, maybe a little juice there, Tavondre Sweat and McKinley Jackson, no juice. They are nose tackles. They are... <laughs> Yeah. They are what they are, okay? And they're not going to affect passing downs, so they're not premium picks. And and that was just sort of a question that that uh, was answered. All right, combine winners and losers. Uh, kind of a super XL episode, but that happens. I like to talk. Peter likes to talk. And, and we hope that you guys enjoyed this. Peter, thank you so much for your time, man. Of course. All right, wrapping things up. We're going to do it real fast. By the draft guide. Promo code daily, D-A-I-L-Y, for 10% off. Easy. Follow me. I am at Ross Uglum. Follow Peter. He's easy to find on Twitter as well. And uh, like and subscribe. Do all the things you're supposed to do. We'll even give you a quick shout-out to both. Uh, like and subscribe to the Pack-A-Day podcast. Like and subscribe to Lockdown Packers. You're welcome. <laughs>